Excellent. Well, the technology is working, so that's always a good thing. Um, yes, this morning I will seek to explain why I believe that the English seaside could be considered uh, for a place in the pantheon of world heritage. The country, this country invented this form of uh, tourism, um, this popular form of leisure, and provided access to it for the masses represents a fundamental stage in history, where England led countries around the world forward. While I believe that English seaside might be sufficiently significant to seek world heritage inscription, would anyone want this recognition with the responsibilities and costs that this would incur? Now, um, as Phil suggested, this paper arose out of one of those dreaded Zoom meetings that we've all come to know and love. Um, we were online um, just introducing ourselves to Eastern Art. Um, we're part of the Seaside Heritage Network. I'm one of the founding members. And we were founded in September 2022 to bring together individuals and groups with a shared interest in seaside heritage around the United Kingdom. This is seaside specifically as opposed to coastal. We're also to, seeking to celebrate the unique contribution of seaside heritage to British life and to demonstrate the importance of, the, of its built heritage. And we're also seeking to raise the profile of seaside heritage by giving it a collective voice. That's our website there at the bottom. Um, we do this through um, sort of having talks every couple of months, uh, online seminars. We get between 50 and 80 sort of people attending. We've got about nearly 2,000 people who are members of the network. Um, we've done topics like seaside swimming. We ran an in-person ball of art deco walking tour. And we've done things on the Celtic seaside, because it's not just England, although I'm pretty well going to talk about England today. Uh, but we've looked at sort of the seaside around the British Isles, and um, looked at transport to the seaside. Um, seaside entertainment, um, we've got Joe there from Swanage, you'll see him again in, in, in a little bit. He's coming to talk to us at Western Supermare. And we've done things on style about fashion at the seaside. So it's trying to be a very broad-based sort of network with lots of it, you know, different sort of interest, heritage, but also sort of museums and, uh, and uh, sort of the whole range of seaside heritage. Our past talks, the most recent ones, are available on YouTube. And we do one in-person event uh, each year. The first one we did was at Blackpool, where we had Wayne Hemingway, and this year's one in September, do come and join us at Western Supermare. At Western Supermare as well, we'll be announcing the winners of the Bucket and Spade list. This is a little social media thing we run each year, um, really to get some people engaged. And we've got over 2,000 votes this year, and people have been voting on things as different as Joe um, running a punch and duty at Swanage Beach, uh, through um, you know, formal sort of heritage like uh, uh, the Leeds lift at Boston, um, the Sunday Liner is on the list. Um, and one of the topics this year we had on the list was the Saucy Seaside Postcard, which led to me, after many years of avoiding being in the sun, I finally made it to the sun. <laughs> My Liverpudlian friends don't speak to me anymore. Um, but we have got a serious side, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we managed to uh, sort of weasel our way into sort of uh, policy makers and get the ears of policy makers. We had a meeting last year with the all-party parliamentary group for coastal communities. And we were advised by one of our members that um, these sort of bodies and organisations can only remember and focus on three things. So only go in and try and sell three things. So what we focused on in that meeting was improved recognition, support, and heritage protection for seaside peers, a very endangered species of in Britain. And the idea of heritage action zones, but targeted at the seaside, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. And thirdly, the thing I'll talk about more today is recognition of our seaside through seeking world heritage inscription. Um, Brighton is better than Nice, I will contend. I will come back to that in a minute. You did ask me to be provocative. <laughs> um, this then led on to a meeting with the Handley Main Lord Parkinson of Whitley Bay. Uh, that was very useful, having a, having a sort of heritage minister um, who had a seaside, uh, not constituency, but you know, uh, his interest. Um, and again, we went in with the three 
things to take away your room. And uh, we came back to this idea of seaside and attraction zones, which I, I mischievously wanted to promote the shazzes, because the idea of official them constantly talking about shazzes uh, was sort of really greatly amusing for me. Um, historic England had been behind the, sort of the creation of heritage action zones, the first of which were completed in, in uh, 2021 2. And, and historic England then went on to create high street heritage action zones to stimulate the high street. And with the slogan that they had of breeding a new life into all places, the aim of these uh, heritage action zones was to make the, the places more attractive to residents, businesses, tourists, and investors. Investment went into improving the fabric of a few targeted historic buildings and parts of the public realm. Investment also went into cultural programs, and historic England was also involved with providing assistance. To, uh, to the community, conducting and commissioning research, uh, improving conservation area documentation, and putting on events and exhibitions. And in, in the case of the two seaside resorts that were in the first heritage, uh, round of heritage action zones, uh, Western Super Mayor, which you can see there in the banner, um, and Ramsgate, um, they also wrote uh, and published two books. Um, 7th of March 2024 was Heritage Day, and we left the idea of the seaside heritage action zones with Lord Parkinson, and we were very gratified um, when he decided he was going to run with that idea. I say in March 2024, it's become obvious why I couldn't have decided that day. Now, in his speech uh, at, Heri at um, Heritage Day, on Heritage Day, he said, another part of our heritage which is much cherished, but which also needs support, is our seaside heritage, something I've seen on my visits to coastal communities. He then went on to say, that's why I'm delighted to announce that we'll soon be launching a dedicated fund to support enhancements to our seaside heritage, drawing on the successes of recent programmes like the High Street Heritage Action Zones, help protect and rejuvenate coastal assets, which are in need of large attention. As always, we are keen to do that in collaboration with the brilliant people and organisations in the sector. So please watch out for more details and help us make a difference to coastal communities across the country. However, <laughs> a certain general election has intervened, and that idea has been parked. We had a meeting at DCMS where they told us they have parked it, they haven't completely ruled it out in the future, but it is essentially part of the term here. Second issue we tackled with Lord Parkinson was improving the heritage protection, the recognition of the importance of seaside heritage through the, the heritage protection system. But the third proposal, which is the one I want to come on to today, was that we pushed again the idea that the English seaside, I'm very specific here about the English seaside, I am a Scot, so it's a bit of you know, carpet bagging coming down the end. But um, very specifically, the English seaside might be worthy of inscription as part of our world heritage. And so, for comic effect, and to make my task to convince me even more difficult, I give you Giza versus J. Wick Sand. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one, I promise. <laughs> So to be included in the world, on the World Heritage List, um, sites must be of outstanding universal value and meet at least one of ten selection criteria. I'm going to just look at numbers one to four you'd be pleased to hear the brain. So number one is to represent a masterpiece of human creative genius. So we're very much in the um, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper or Shark Cathedral territory. Well, um, in Britain, we have got a few examples that are inscribed on that basis. Uh, Canterbury, with its astonishing um, early French Gothic uh, choir, brilliant thing in art. I don't start me on that subject. Um, and of course, um, Greenwich. And then for inscription under uh, criterion two, to exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time or within a cultural area of the world on developments in architecture, technology, monumental arts, town planning, or landscape design. 
And within this category, you have Durham Cathedral and Castle with the amazing sort of Romanist church there, and the Tower of London because of its importance in the foundation of the, the Norman. Uh, Norman architecture in England, but also the Norman state. Criterion three is to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or a civilization which is living or which has disappeared. And two of the examples we have in Britain are the heart of the Orkney okay, with the amazing sky grey and the castle and town walls of King Edward uh, and Gwynedd. And then criterion four is to be an outstanding example of a town of building architectural or technological ensemble or landscape which illustrates a or significant stages in human history. And for this couple of examples, all the old and new towns in Edinburgh, two very different visions of town planning, if you can call the old town planned as such, um, and the Palace of Westminster and Westminster Abbey because of its long connection with uh, our constitutional democracy. So I just want to concentrate on those four criteria today. And as you've seen, we have fairly predictable candidates, cathedrals, castles, ancient sites, classical architecture. And that's the type of sites that countries initially put forward to UNESCO to inscribe as World Heritage Sites. But in more recent times, the definition has widened, at least in part, due to British effort. And of course, we've started to put forward important industrial sites like Iron Bridge, not just the bridge, but the whole sort of complex. And why not inscribed because of its significance in the story of, sort of Ireland and coal in the 19th century. And then in 2001, we went and inscribed the Derwent Valley Mills, Saltair, a, a community that, uh, founded near Bradford, um, and New Lanark in southern Scotland. So in total, out of the 35 inscribed sites in Britain, 10 of them actually reflect our industrial heritage. France, in contrast, has two of its 52. Germany has three of its 53. Italy has only two of its 59. And surprisingly, the USA has none. But UNESCO can only inscribe what's put forward by countries and examine the cases that are advanced for each, each uh, inscription. The examples I've been looking at have been old and ancient thus far, but in recent uh, years we've started to see more descriptions of modern um, architecture, modern sites. Now, this is um, three of the eight buildings in the United States designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and his uh, work was inscribed in 2019. Uh, in Germany, the Bauhaus and its various sites were inscribed in 1996. And for a transnational inscription, a serial property, and the work of Le Corbusier was recognised in 2016, with sites in France, Argentina, Switzerland, India, Japan, etc. So increasingly, UNESCO is happy to inscribe groupings rather than just single sites, uh, sometimes by architect or theme, and often across borders. And amongst the recent ones were the funerary monuments of the First World War, um, and the Schulm sites of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz in Germany. Um, the acronym Schulm stands for the Hebrew initials of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. And I went to actually look at some of these sites while I was visiting the cathedrals last year. So, World Heritage reflects worship and work, the Grand Palace, the workers' homes, memorials, historic figures, the ancient and the modern. Something is almost entirely missing, and that is sites that are created for leisure. Yet, leisure is an important part of people's lives. According to the Office of National Statistics in 2023, we spend an average of 3 hours 44 minutes per day um, on leisure, entertaining, socialising, and other free time activities. However, I have to caution the fact that 2 hours 16 minutes were spent watching television. I figure that went up quite dramatically during COVID. I mentioned COVID because of this next graph. This is about holiday habits, and I wonder if you can spot where COVID has intervened in these cars. <laughs> um, you can see that the huge drop-off there for the year 2020 to 21 in both graphs. Um, but this gives you some idea, I mean, if you look at the top graph, 84% of people uh, in 2023 took holidays uh, within the last 12 months. So holidays are big business. 
Um, in 2019, which is prior to COVID, a survey found that uh, there were 21 million overnight domestic visits uh, to the coast. The problem is this, this trying to tease out seaside and the coast is quite difficult in these figures. Um, 169 million day visits. And in total, this represents uh, uh, supported 210,000 jobs. The, the uh, 2023 figure uh, from another survey suggests there were 15 million overnight trips to the seaside, worth approximately 4.2 billion pounds. There is, however, just one British, inverted commas, seaside resort that's a World Heritage Site, and that is Nice. It is inscribed as Nice, a winter resort town of the Riviera. On the UNESCO site, it states that from the mid 18th century, Nice attracted growing numbers of aristocratic and upper class families, mainly British, who developed into the habit of spending their winters there. Winters, emphasis there on winter. The Camarade the des Ingles, des, des Ingles uh, a modest park which had been created along the coastline by British winter visitors in 1824, subsequently became the prestigious Promenade des Anglais. After the city was ceded to France in 1860, and thanks to its connection to the European rail network, an increasing number of winter visitors from all countries flocked to the city. In the accompanying English press documentation, it, the documentation opens with this paragraph, which I think is very important and very useful. Tourism is today a major economic and civilizational phenomenon. According to the 2018 reports of the World Tourism Organization, it involves nearly 1.4 billion people, generates 10% of global GDP, and continues to grow. Although its consequences sometimes represent risk to heritage preservation, the example of Nice demonstrates how tourism can also produce original heritage. It is worth noting that none of the properties currently on the World Heritage List are concerned with the theme of tourism as such. In this regard, Nice's nomination explores in an original way a new sphere of world heritage. The outstanding universal value of Nice property therefore concerns its nature as a new type of human settlement, thus meeting the needs of Criterion 4. In this case, they're actually talking about Nice being a winter resort. Now, when first mooted, Nice was considered to be inscribed as Nice, capital of Riviera tourism, suggesting that it had led the way in the invention uh, with the invention of the seaside phenomenon. That was the situation in 2015 when the people who were working on the Nice uh, bid met at the English seaside. I was invited to join, I have these wonderfully grand things, I was invited to join the International Scientific Committee um, and Julie gave a paper in the Welsh Schoolboy French exploring two versions of the English seaside resort as embodied in Brighton and Blackpool. This led to a site visit the following year, 2016, to Brighton um, with Nice's puzzled lead researcher who couldn't believe how good Brighton was. <laughs> and how much older, often bigger, more varied, and sometimes grander than the buildings along the promenade des Anglais. I was always amused by, I was walking along and I would say, ah, begun in the 1820s, and she'd say, no, no, 1920s. I went, no, 1820s. Uh, this is Kent Town at Brighton, this vast uh, complex of buildings that actually was begun in 1823. Nice's reaction to seeing Brighton made me realise how special the English seaside resort was. So I'd like to now um, see how the English seaside might match the relevant UNESCO criteria. So, criteria one, to represent a masterpiece of human creative genius. Ah, uh, well, this is no Last Supper. It's not a sharp cathedral. I mean, it is very good. You know the story, I won't bore you. Uh, Prince Regent uh, doing up the old sort of neoclassical building to be that remarkable building. But it's a stunning building. I mean, there's just one of the interiors for any of you who don't spend a lot of time hanging around in Brighton. 
And at the other end of the country, at the other end of the 19th century, and towards the other end of our legendary class system, is Blackpool Tower. Um, this is an aerial films photograph from the Historic England collection. Um, along the top, along the bottom of the tower, at the top of the building, I don't know if you can read that there, but on that photograph it says, modestly, the wonderland of the world. <laughs> so when uh, Blackpool Tower opened in 1894, it was the tallest structure in Britain and remained so for much of the 20th century, it's only in the 1960s they had taller buildings. Within the complex was an aquarium, a menagerie, a monkey house, an aviary, a seal pond, a bear cage, it's all very politically incorrect, isn't it? But perhaps most famously, the circus, and the ballroom, where I have twinkled around on the floor a few times. Not a pretty sight. Impressive as they are, I doubt this would probably be the best criteria to, to explore. But if we go to the second criteria, to exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time, etc., etc. Um, on the UNESCO site for Bath, it states, Bath exemplifies the 18th century move away from the inward-looking uniform streets, street layouts of Renaissance cities that dominated the 15th to 17th century, towards the idea of planting buildings and cities in the landscape to achieve picturesque views and forms, which could be seen echoed around Europe, particularly in the 19th century. Bath's urban and landscape spaces are created by the buildings that enclose them, providing a series of interlinked spaces that flow organically and that visually, and at times physically, draw in the green surrounding countryside to create a distinctive garden city feel, looking forward to the principles of garden cities developed by 19th century town plans. For countryside in the case of Bath, we might substitute embracing the sea. It's health-giving properties, the idea of planting buildings and cities to embrace the sea and the view. Uh, this is Brunswick Town, um, which begun, begins to be constructed from 1824, and it's at the other end of Brighton from Kent. It's just technically most of it is in Hove. Seaside resorts took some of the, the finest Georgian architectural forms that have been pioneered in London, Bath, and other various inland cities, and gave them a sea view. So here we have the wonderful array of Georgian and early Victorian terraces that line the esplanade at Weymouth, almost always unnoticed by people who are on the beach just to the right of the photograph, and the wonderful Hesketh Crescent of 1845 related to Torquay. But unlike Bath and various other spa towns, that approach, that interest in buildings and the sea didn't just peter out in the 18th and early 19th century, but continued at seaside resorts well into the 20th century. The seaside had not been a simple dalliance with romantic notions for the wealthiest in society, but during the 19th century became embedded in the very fabric of British life. And this brings me to criterion three and the greediness of Bath. Not content with being inscribed as a world heritage site once, Bath is part of a second transnational serial property, the great spa towns of Europe. And this is a couple of images of Vichy. And it's inscribed in this group uh, because of the, the significance of spa towns you know, as a particular cultural tradition. The inscription for this group of sites reads, the great spa towns of Europe bears exceptional testimony to the European spa phenomenon, which has its roots in antiquity, but gained its highest expression from around 1700 to the 1930s. Part of the inscription for the great spa towns of Europe could equally apply to the seaside. So what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to read out this next part, but instead of pictures of spa towns, I'm going to substitute them. Uh, substitute some of the words with pictures of seaside resorts in England. So part of the inscription reads, taking the cure, either externally by bathing or internally by drinking and inhaling, involved a highly structured and timed daily regime and a combination of medical aspects and leisure. 
These are a couple of sea bathing hospitals that we have in surviving in England. Including entertainment and social activities. For example, gambling, theatre, music, dancing, as well as taking physical exercise within an outdoor therapeutic spa landscape. Here's a couple, just two at random examples of the wonderful entertainment heritage the seaside resorts of England have. It then goes on to say these parameters directly influence the spatial layout of spa towns and the form and function of spa buildings or spa architecture. Urban parks and promenades allow people to take the cure to see and be seen by others. Well, I've just illustrated the words of the spa inscription um, using things from the English seaside and the Welsh seaside, if I like, on the European law. And then we come on to criteria four, to be an, an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural or technological ensemble or landscape, which illustrates a significant stage in human history. Now, Nice had decided it wanted to be inscribed under this one, and this is one of the, the reactions I got from my, my the, the, the nice lady I was walking around Brighton. When she saw the Grand Hotel, she couldn't believe that that was 50 years before the Nice's greatest hotel, the Madresco. I would suggest that the English seaside could meet criteria four, as can be argued that it was very much a part of the Industrial Revolution. John Walton suggested that Blackpool had to be considered in this context as a factory, and that rather than producing cotton or iron, it was producing leisure. A more radical assertion might be that the creation of the English seaside resort was at the heart of a parallel leisure revolution that by the 19th century would impact on the lives of almost everyone. Therefore, it would illustrate a significant stage in human history. Europe was a long way behind uh, England with uh, the creation of seaside resorts. We begin this process right at the beginning of the 18th century uh, at resorts as different as Scarborough, Margate, Brighton, and Liverpool. That's going to seem a bit odd, I'll explain in a moment. There's a great, the earliest sea view, uh, earliest view of sea bathing at Scarborough in 1735. And that funny little building on the shoreline at the far left in, in, of the um, detail of Liverpool is an early bathhouse where there was a primitive bathing machine and sea bathing was taking place, if you can call swimming in the Mersey sea bathing. I've got a slightly stretch by the rock there. And a very distinct culture develops in, in England during the 18th century. And by the early 19th century, we're beginning to get mass tourism to English seaside resorts. We have the steamers going down the Clyde and then the Thames to places like Margate. And of course, this brought significant numbers of people from London. Um, we're talking about 100,000 a year at its peak coming down the river uh, to, to visit Margate. But of course, those figures would be dwarfed by the time we get to the railways in the 19th century. Um, and there's an uh, old postcard view of Brighton, a phenomenal station with huge numbers passing through there each year. Um, and what's interesting is that Europe just follows the English seaside uh, resort, follows the pattern that was set by English seaside resorts in the 18th century, but it does it in the 19th century. And it was the cold north of Europe, really from northern France to the Baltic, rather than the warm south that led the way, aping English attitudes to sea bathing, adopting English practices, and importing some features from the English seaside resort. And I want to just look at a couple of examples. Um, the Barmy bathing machine, for any of you who don't know this, in the 18th and 19th century, the way you were expected to bathe in the sea was to go into one of those stupid machines, be dragged out into the sea, go down the steps, have a little dip in the water under that sort of hood, come back in, change, and by the time you got back to the shore, you could get out and get on with the rest of your day. And it was literally the first thing you would do each day. And there's, that's the very earliest view of a fully developed uh, bathing machine um, at Margate. It's inside a book in the Society of Antiquities. And then there's still occupying beaches at Broadstairs there in around 1900. And lo and behold, the Europeans informed this absolute balmy system. Um, and there's some examples. There's Boulogne, 
There's Ostend and Jurmala. Jurmala is the seaside resort uh, beside Riga in Latvia. A slightly more sensible thing to have imported was the seaside pier. It began just as a simple jetty for landing people who were coming to the resort, but very quickly during the 19th century, it is increased in size, and buildings are added to it, and becomes an entertainment complex. Uh, we're very fortunate to have three Victorian peers surviving at Blackpool um, of um, 1863 in the foreground, 1868 in the middle, and in the, front, in the distance, 1893. And in this neck of the woods, we still have um, Brighton's Palace Pier of 1889 and Chrome's Pier of 1901. During the Second World War, a number of the piers, particularly in the south and the east of uh, England, um, were partially blown up, had central sections removed so they couldn't be used for, by the enemy uh, to, to invade. Um, and so the ones along the south and east coast suffered this fate. Um, the ones on the west coast were, were left intact. But of course, it was worse for um, seaside resorts on the continent because they had slightly more direct experience of Adolf Hitler. Um, so the, the Victorian pier there at Nice actually went in 1942. Uh, it closed in 42, was stripped of all its metals to be used uh, in the war effort. And then the opposite effect, if you like, at Skaveningen in, in the Netherlands, its original um, pier, which opened in 1901, was demolished in 1943 uh, as it was likely to interfere with the Atlantic War. Um, and it was replaced by this amazing one. Of and another sort of um, particular thing I want to mention is about sea bathing hospitals. Um, Margate uh, was founded opened in 1796, a sea bathing hospital, and this was a hospital where we treated people um, in the case of many of them who got various sort of conditions. But it was a specialist hospital treating using seawater and sea bathing. Um, and this is a thing that didn't really catch on much in Britain. There were two or three other examples following on from Margate. But it had a huge impact on the continent, particularly in Italy and France, where in the case, in the case of France, they have lots of these Hôpital Maritime. Um, and in, in, in um, Italy, they have Spizzi Marini. Um, these are sort of um, sea bathing hospitals for treating people along the, the two countries' coastline. And so I think it's, but this is an important heritage that we didn't know about, didn't really follow up on in, in Britain, but was followed up in Europe. So I hear you all say, um, that if the English seaside resort is such an obvious candidate for world heritage, world heritage inscription, um, why hasn't this happened already? Well, it has been mooted in the past with regards to just Blackpool. It submitted its nomination form to DCMS in 2010, and the form read, Blackpool has a unique history and heritage as a centre of popular culture and recreation. The proposed site encompasses those parts that commemorate and perpetuate Blackpool's identity as the world's first working class seaside resort. When plans were first revealed, we put the resort forward as a, uh, because we put the, the resort forward as a potential world heritage site, many in the heritage sector considered the bid audacious and counterintuitive. I think that's a polite phrase. <laughs> and joined initially at least in the widespread media condescension towards the proposal. But once the birth gave way to serious thought about the economic and cultural significance of the seaside in British society and beyond, it is clear that Blackpool is recognised by academics and cultural experts as an exceptional place, a view endorsed by millions of people who return there each year. Um, so Blackpool applied, it wants to be inscribed against the, you know, criteria three, criteria four, because it was an important stage you know, in, in cultural, <coughs> key cultural export, an important stage in world history. And it still has an impressive selection of buildings that survive, and both, I think, are true. But why did the bid fail? Um, 2010, um, you apply to uh, be inscribed as a working class uh, seaside resort in 2010, uh, just as the Labour government is going out of power. 
on the uh, application, it had to tick. It had to say, what benefits do you think World Heritage Site description would bring? Well, it would tick all the boxes, because you obviously going to tick all the boxes, won't it? But it then went on to list in more detail the benefits. So it wanted to safeguard and sympathetically develop the town's built heritage, living traditions, and historic collection, act as a driver for sustainable regeneration, raise quality in new development in the public realm, lever in, in lever inward investment, redefine the resort's destination marketing, build the visitor economy, raise civic pride, actively engage communities, etc. etc. And effectively, we could just lift all of these goals and take them from Blackpool and use them in a wider sort of English seaside world heritage inscription. So if this English seaside was to be put forward for world heritage inscription, would it be worth the trouble and the cost? Well, picking one case entirely at random, um, Amandine Crepin, the director of the Champagne Hillside Houses and Cellars mission, believes that the work that it is worth the work and the trouble. She wrote, inscription on the World Heritage List now attracts tourists from around the world. We are therefore committed to preserving our sites for future generations and protecting them against the risks of degradation. So this is a case where they believe that it's thought to be good for tourism and for conservation. But does World Heritage really increase visit the numbers? And if so, could newly designated places cope with more visitors. An Italian journalist, Marco del Daramo, coined the term UNESCO site in 2014. He described how a site being added to the list can be a kiss of death and all too often cures the disease by killing the patient. Now, I think you might be going slightly over the top because World Heritage Inscription can only be partially responsible for over tourism in Venice and say places like Dubrovnik because they were incredibly popular destinations long before inscription and before the, the modern era of mass tourism. But the effects of the visitor influx, flux prompted UNESCO to consider adding Venice to the list of 56 World Heritage Sites in danger. But just along the coast of Trieste, um, it's not a World Heritage Site and it still suffers the same plague, I think you could call it, the cruise ships. So has Venice suffered or benefited from inscription? A DCMS report found the inscription in Britain had mixed results, increasing visitor numbers at some resorts, while not having any effect at others. However, what inscription might do is encourage visitors from abroad to seek to enjoy the English seaside and draw them away from those standard stops of London. Bath, Oxford, Cambridge, Stratford, York, and Edinburgh. This might be a small, possibly lucrative extra source of income, but I think perhaps more significantly, inscription could be used to market seaside resorts as worthwhile destinations outside just the summer months. People visit George and Bath all year round. One year I was there on Christmas morning, and there were more than a smattering of foreign tourists admiring the sites in uncharacteristically quiet streets. So why not a winter visit to Georgia Weymouth in January? That was literally January, very nice day it was, and Victoria in Western in February. But against inscription can be an issue of freedom to develop. There are actually no additional restrictions imposed by being inscribed, but there is perhaps greater and louder scrutiny of developments to safeguard the potential character of the historic environment. Liverpool has fallen foul of these despite a series of warnings from UNESCO and Historic England, and it has had the ignominy of being delisted at the World Heritage Site in 2021, a fate it shared with the Dresden Elbow Valley in Germany and the Arabian Oryx Sanctuary in Oman. Liverpool's Head of Heritage Preservation and Development said that Liverpool didn't need it, and he argued there was no evidence that delisting would negatively impact tourism. One local architect said, it was obviously a loss of recognition from a heritage perspective, but if you speak to an average Liverpool resident, they may not have been aware of the status or really appreciated the value that it could bring. Meanwhile, the pressure for development in London is threatening Greenwich, 
and the terror of London. UNESCO was very concerned, particularly about the encroaching uh, tower blocks on the, on the uh, site of the Tower of London there, on what's on left. So inscription might be thought to hinder the development of seaside resorts and therefore thereby restrict some investment. There are also costs involved in bidding for world heritage status. And if successful, maintaining the status and carrying out the administrative <coughs> duties that come with the inscription. A spokesman commenting on Kenya's historic towns, uh, that, what, that are the ones that are well on heritage sites, said, we are trapped by UNESCO's rules, but there are no funds. Referring to the UNESCO regulations uh, around the changes that can and cannot be made, and at, at near World Heritage sites. In fact, they're not UNESCO regulations, they are national rules. For a relatively prosperous country uh, like England, like the UK, it wouldn't necessarily be much of a burden, although it might be to any of the individual resorts that are involved in the inscription. Um, it would be just another burden on already tightly squeezed budgets. So, to summarise, I would argue that the invention of this popular form of leisure and access for masses to it represents a vital stage in history and that the English seaside has the right to claim its place in the pantheon of world heritage sites. I believe that UNESCO would embrace the proposal. We have some important Georgian seaside heritage, including this wonderful uh, 1760s retirement house. I always said retirement home, I meant a retirement house, India House at Margate. Um, and of course, the Royal Pavilion of Brighton. We have great Victorian heritage, be it the Grand Hotels or the Mighty Tower at Blackpool. We have an amazing collection of interwar buildings across the country, not just the Delaware Pavilion. And at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, we have more pre 1939 fairground rides than at any other amusement park in the world. And Blackpool Pleasure Beach has more pre 1939 rides than any other country in the world, with the exception of the USA. And it also has there on the right, the oldest fairground ride that is still operating anywhere in the world. So I believe that this would be a strong case, but which resorts might wish to be a part of this serial property? It might be good for the UK, but would it be good for individual resorts? It might be that the publicity in the short term would be beneficial, beneficial but what about the costs in the long term? To use a ghastly media term, might being on the journey be better than arriving at the destination? Then there's the issue of how such a bid would be put together. Which organisation might lead this, or would a new body be established, with all the consequent expenses and turf wars? And what competition might a seaside bid face? Um, that was my bombshell slide for being on the journey, and I just realised I haven't put it on. <laughs> and what competition? This is the UK tentative list, and that's all we have on at the moment, just those five there. There's a new list that's going to be worked up, uh, ready for uh, publishing in 2033, so we've got plenty of time to, to work on a proposal. So what competitors might lie in the future against a possible uh, World Heritage bid for the English seaside? Well, believe it or not, at one time, there was discussion about getting Benidorm inscribed as a seaside, well on heritage site, um, which I thought was perhaps pushing on. And then um, Otto Smith um, has suggested that Stoke-on-Trent could be proposed for well on heritage inscription. Now, I spent many a happy hour, even a merry day, at Stoke-on-Trent. But I think if it had, was to become a well on heritage site, it would bring me back to exactly where I began which is, you are having a laugh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan. A lot to uh, mull over, think about, provoke. Do people have specific questions, ideas, thoughts, and comments on anything that um, uh, Alan has raised in, um, in that talk? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, no, it's a really um, excellent presentation. We've talked about any 
Billy uh, is someone who was born and at least nine years bred in Clapton. So I've got, I've got a vested interest in this. And um, the question I started to really uh, run through my head was you can see the kind of big headlines and the attraction in terms of uh, what that might mean for the councils, uh, the, the big investors in that region. But I was, I, I was speaking to Hull, and it's not a disease, I mean, but it's a, it is water oriented. And Hull has invested a lot in its heritage recently. Um, and it's done really well. It's the, 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 the East Coast city that's really sort of counted in. It's done really, really well. However, there is this feeling that it is leaving its population behind. And I think that's quite a common feature where heritage is being. And I think this, this is something we can bear in mind for the day. Really, I noticed that the bottom two was a set of bullet, bullet points you had, where at the top it was about kind of big investment, at the bottom it was about engaging communities and things, yeah. And communities, yeah. and I wonder about more of a bottom up approach. I know that this has been an issue that's been raised at least in the form, but there have been some really successful projects where the people have reached out to the community and got. Um, I don't think Blackpool, when he made that list up, was necessarily suggesting that there were lower priorities or further down. Um, I think knowing Blackpool as well as I do, I think they were probably a, quite a high priority. But it is all too easy for you know, you know, heritage to become the thing that sort of goes off on its own, if you like, rather than with the community. There's a, there's a big, there's a, interesting, but you mentioned about Clacton, I don't want to talk about Clacton for, for perhaps obvious reasons, but some seaside resorts um, are now suffering a little bit from beginning to lose some of their identity. And it's not so much in the south and the east, but take an example of uh, North Yorkshire. Um, Scarborough, Whitby, no longer have their own council. They're part of a York, North Yorkshire council. Um, and this, I think, is going to be a problem because Although it will give, in a sense, that body bigger hitting power, those kind of those mayors will have bigger hitting power, they're perhaps going to be able to draw down more funding. They're going to go, essentially that money's going to go into the centre of a new thing and not make it out to the coast. And this is one of the phenomena that we've been beginning to become concerned about in the Seaside Heritage Network, uh, because we just think that some seaside resorts are going to lose identity. So that's Identity at all levels, that's not just about sort of the local community, but the sort of the wider uh, sort of identity. So I think there are lots of problems. And I'm only, I mean, I wouldn't be even begin to imagine how one would get this thing off the ground. Um, it would have to be done with a mixture of top down and bottom up to, to be successful. I mean, it would have to start with a bit of a top down and just to get a structure in place to then bring it to, uh, resorts along. But which resorts would want to be involved? If Brighton didn't want to be involved, the whole thing would fold, I would suggest. <laughs> All the people in Brighton here. Um, it would be the, the absolute key one, as I think with Blackpool. Um, and then you'd be, you'd be looking at sort of a number of other ones. Um, some of which would be there because they've got a very strong community identity, some because they've got a very strong heritage identity. And I think you'd have to try and find a balance with that. One at the back. Very interesting talk. I'm Carolee back from Time Saves with our Go to Unit Store, which has already got dozens and dozens of um, projects. The town, which probably would be eligible for designation, has already lost masses of its population and tourists. We're very close to Canterbury, which is a UNESCO site, which is also under threat. If anybody visits it there, you can probably understand. But what I really wanted to say was um, there's this upswing, upsurge in uh, Spain and other places against tourism. And there's a real campaign to keep tourism out. Could you see that happening if we designate 
um, seaside towns in Britain happening because it's already happening on a small scale without <coughs> designation. I, well, I would hope it wouldn't happen. Um, you know, we have such an affection for the English seaside. Now, I think everybody here has been to the English seaside at least once. We all got some positive memory. I don't think World Heritage Inscription, I don't think a growing number of people going to the seaside would put people off. Um, it might be that, I say, I would hope that a World Heritage Inscription would widen the audience, maybe not necessarily increase it in, in size that much. Um, because I see a lot of these seaside resorts as great historic towns. I walk around them going, oh, it's a great historic town. The number of times I've been in the sea in the last 20 years I've been working on this, I could, one or two hands, um, because I see them as historic towns, much as I would walk around Stratford or York or, or, or uh, Bath. Um, and so I'd like people to think of them in those terms. And I think this is, well, imagine, you know, people wanting to go in the spring and the autumn rather than just for the, the seaside holiday. And I think it would be great places to, 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 to build on that. But we don't want to start a discussion today about the Airbnb. I mean, I, I quite like using them, but they are a nightmare. I mean, they are going to be real trouble. Uh, and we're all just beginning to see that happening. But I don't think I want to start on that topic today. <laughs> There's somebody there at the back. Okay, I think last question before the uh, break. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the, the cause of some of the concerns that we have. So the, the cheap flights that allow people to go, I'm thinking there could be environmental incentives to, say, use taxes on flights to fund these seasides, and then you have people who are not contributing as much to the climate disaster, like yeah. flying off to Spain or, or whatnot. Oh, um, yeah, and I mean, the government has been governments of various types have been you know slated for imposing sort of large sort of um, costs on people going on holiday the classic mum dad and two kids have got to pay an extra 200 pounds or whatever it is now to just go on holiday how terrible that is i don't think it's terrible at all i think it's a very good thing and i do think it would be a very very if you could actually get some of the money that is generated by by discouraging people to go to terrible, I mean, some of those resorts on the Mediterranean coast are absolutely terrible. I mean, I really don't see what people see in them, apart from the sun and, the, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Anyway, standing here in Norwich on a lovely September day. But um, I, I think we could, you know, the, the, the thing about the English seaside is there's just so much to do. You go to a Mediterranean beach, you, you sit on the beach, you go in the sea, you drink beer, uh, and is that about it? Whereas you go to the English seaside, it's an absolute riot of activity. It's a wonder, I mean, hopefully you get from my, from my presentation, my enthusiasm for it, but also just what a remarkable and varied place the English seaside is. And I think we should start trying to sell it more positively, rather than just, you know, hiding, hiding it away almost, and just relying on the existing market, because the bad news for the English seaside is that the existing market is dying um, because you know it's, it's essentially an older demographic was still loyal to the seaside. We've got to make sure that young people, the families, are still want to go to the seaside in England. Great, thank you very much, um, Alan. Uh, Join me again in thanking Alan for a really stimulating.